Hello and welcome to the second lecture on MOS dynamic circuits and here is the agenda of today's lecture after a brief introduction where I shall recapitulate what has been discussed in the last lecture in brief and then we shall discuss about uh, various limitations of dynamic CMOS circuits in this lecture. Uh, as you have mentioned in the last lecture, there are three serious limitations. Number one is charge leakage problem, second one is charge sharing problem, third is clock skew problem. And we shall discuss how these problems can be overcome with the help of additional circuits. Finally, I shall end, end my talk with a brief summary. Uh, here is a brief recap about what we discussed in the last lecture. As we know, static CMOS circuits can be realized by using a PMOS pull down network and a NMOS, sorry, a PMOS pull up network and a NMOS pull down network and uh, inputs are applied to both of them and output is taken uh, from the middle of these two points. And uh, we can realize uh, dynamic CMOS circuits either by using the NMOS pull down network as you can see in this diagram only the NMOS pull down network is used. Uh, of course, we have got two additional transistor, one is footer transistor which is a NMOS transistor and a header transistor which is a PMOS transistor. So, these two transistors are there where a common clock is applied and uh, as usual primary inputs are applied to the NMOS pull down network and output is taken uh, from the uh, source of the PMOS transistor. Okay. Similarly, we can use only the PMOS pull down uh, pull up network part and uh, you can see uh, the header and footer transistors are there as usual. However, in this particular case output has to be taken from the uh, top of the footer transistor. So, instead of taking the output from the uh, source of the pull down uh, pull up net transistor that is PMOS transistor here you are output taking you are taking the output from the drain of the uh, pull down transistor. So, uh, as you can see we are not duplicating PMOS and NMOS network only one of them is used as a consequence uh, it has got many advantages as I mentioned. Uh, number one is the number of transistors required for a circuit with fan in N is N plus 2 in case of static CMOS circuit. Uh, I mean N plus 2 in contrast to 2N in case of static CMOS circuits. We have seen in case of static CMOS you will require N transistors here, N transistors here. So, 2 N transistors are required whereas, you require N transistors here and 2 more. So, you require N plus 2 in this configuration as well as here also you will require 2, tra two additional transistor and N transistors. So, N plus 2 in both the cases. <coughs> and the load capacitance is more than 50 percent less than that of static CMOS and is closer to that of pseudo NMOS. Uh, this is because you can see this output is uh, will go to a, to a next stage where both PMOS and NMOS transistors are present here, but in, in case of dynamic CMOS circuits the output will be going only uh, to the to the uh, NMOS uh, network or PMOS network. As a consequence, the capacitance will be less than 50 percent uh, that of uh, static CMOS circuits and as a consequence the circuits are faster and as I mentioned the speed of operation is about four, four times faster than that of static CMOS circuits. So, we get very high speed of operation and also the static power dissipation is very small. The reason for that is uh, there is no uh, short circuit path. I mean an at, uh, at no point of time uh, there is direct path from VDD to ground because either this transistor is on or this transistor is on and uh, as a consequence there, uh, the, the short circuit uh, uh, sorry the static power dissipation is not there. Moreover, uh, there is no short, short circuit power dissipation as it is pre present in static CMOS circuits. We know that in case of static CMOS circuits when the input is changing from 0 to VDD uh, in the region between uh, VTN to VDD minus VTP uh, there is a short circuit path from the um, through the PMOS and N NMOS network, but in this particular case that does not arise because uh, you can see. Uh, uh, it has got two phases as I mentioned pre-charge and uh, evaluation phase and 
uh, one of the two transistors is always on and as a consequence at no point of time there is a current path from VDD to ground. So, there is no short circuit for dissipation in both these configurations. Finally, uh, there is no glitching for dissipation as well in case of uh, dynamic CMOS circuits. The reason for that is in case of uh, uh, static CMOS circuits, you know uh, depending on the change in the inputs, you know if the input keeps on changing in a multi level network, you know the inputs can arrive at different points of time and that may lead to change in the output from 0 to 1, 1 to 0 uh, before settling down to a final value. So, the output may keep on changing uh, before the output is uh, finally settled down after a, a certain delay. Uh, there can be many changes that may lead to what is known as glitching power dissipation, but that is also not present in case of dynamic CMOS circuits because as you know uh, in the free charge phase the output is uh, pre charged to a high level and only transition that can occur after the I mean in the evaluation phase is in this particular case 1 to 0. No two or three times change is possible here. Similarly, here uh, the, ch the only change that can occur in the evaluation phase is from 0 to 1 or it may remain 0. So, only one transition is possible. So, there is no bridging power dissipation in dynamic uh, CMOS circuits. So, you may say that uh, you may argue that uh, the, the, the dynamic CMOS circuits has have so many advantages. Why everybody is not realizing circuits using only dynamic CMOS circuits? That question may arise, but as we shall see uh, uh, there are some limitations as well and those limitations are very serious and in my last lecture I mentioned about these limitations. Uh, these limitations are number one is charge leakage problem, second is charge sharing problem, third is clock skew problem. So, in this lecture I shall discuss about these limitations one after the other and we shall also see how these problems can be overcome. First let us consider the charge leakage problem. Uh, as you know the operation of a dynamic gate depends on the storage of information in the form of charge on the MOS capacitor. So, as we have seen uh, you are uh, in a in a <coughs> dynamic CMOS circuit uh, let us assume it is a it is realized by using the NMOS network. So, you have got a NMOS network and you have got two transistors, this is the footer transistor, this is the header transistor, you are applying clock phi, you are applying clock phi here and inputs are applied here and output is taken from here and there is a uh, capacitor, let us assume this is the load capacitance. Of course, this is there is no uh, discrete capacitance that is connected, this is essentially the intrinsic capacitance of the next change that acts as a storage element. Now, during the free charge phase this is charged to uh, VDD and during evaluation phase if there is no path through the NMOS network then this uh, voltage is retained, but uh, how long it will retain? Suppose the uh, clock period is too long, in such a case what will happen the capacitor will discharge through uh, this through this NMOS network path. But as I mentioned the NMOS network is off, but unfortunately although it is off you know there are diodes which are reverse biased and this through this reverse biased diode uh, this capacitor will discharge and there may not be just one uh, reverse biased diode, there may be a number of reverse biased diode connected to this point. And as a consequence uh, as you know uh, there is a uh, reverse by a, a diode has a uh, reverse bias uh, current and that current may not be very small and if it if it occurs for a long duration that capacitance will discharge i mean that capacitor will discharge leading to uh, degradation in the output level so the source to drain diffusions from the parasitic diode with the substrate as it is shown here and through that diode this capacitor will keep on discharging and it may so happen that the output will degrade to such a level that uh, next stage will treat it as a low level. 
So, you have to prevent this. Normally, uh, you are familiar with you know dynamic uh, RAM. In the dynamic RAM also, you use capacitor, you use uh, you know capacitors to store information. What do you do in that case? There also you will face the same problem. In case of dynamic CMOS, what you normally do? You keep on refreshing at regular interval. There is a built in refreshing circuit and which keeps on refreshing at regular interval before the output level goes down below certain uh, threshold level. So, this is what is done in case of dynamic RAM, but in, in this particular case uh, what we can do we shall discuss and uh, here uh, some here is some estimate about the uh, diode leakage current. This is the reverse saturation I mean reverse bias current expression I d is equal to I s into e to the power minus q v by k t minus 1. As you can see uh, these parameters q is the charge of electron, k is the temp Boltzmann constant, t is the temperature abs absolute temp temperature in Kelvin uh, and uh, then v is the diode voltage, reverse bias voltage that is being applied this v and this this current has been found to be the order of 0 0.1 nano ampere to 0 0.5 nano ampere at room temperature. But because of the presence of this temperature parameter <coughs> in this expression, uh, the current doubles for every 10 degree increase in temperature. So, uh, you know if the, the, if, the, if, the, if the device becomes hot, then leakage current, leakage current is larger and uh, for every 10 degree increase in temperature this leakage current doubles. So, you have to take precaution about it particularly when the chief is getting is will become a uh, little hot. Now, how can you really compensate this? What can be done? Uh, the, 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 the whatever loss in charge occurs that can be repressed by charging at regular interval. Another alternative is there will be uh, I mean in addition to that current you know this uh, reverse bias diode current nowadays some current flows through this, uh, this channel as well which is known as sub threshold leakage current that too also is not very small in the present day uh, technology uh, particularly in deep submicron sub technology sub threshold leakage current is also substantial and as a consequence you have to minimize these currents or you have to make arrangement to replenish them. The sub threshold leakage current can be minimized by using a transistor of high higher threshold voltage V t. So, as you know this sub threshold leakage current is dependent on the threshold voltage of the device. If the threshold voltage is high, the sub threshold leakage current will be very small and as a consequence uh, it is recommended that the threshold voltage should be on the higher side uh, to reduce this uh, leakage. Third is use of uh, weak PMOS transistor as pull up device. Uh, uh, weak PMOS transistor uh, can be Okay, this use of weak PMOS transistor as pull up device I shall explain while discussing the uh, next uh, limitation because this weak PMOS transistor is used to overcome the second limitation that we shall discuss. So, we shall discuss it together in uh, uh, very soon. So, coming to the second problem that is your charge sharing problem. What is charge sharing problem? Let us try to understand with the help of this diagram. Okay, uh, uh, let me redraw this uh, to explain in little more detail. Uh, let us assume we have a simple circuit, a 3 input uh, NAND gate is realized. So, it is a 3 input NAND gate. Of course, this is the dynamic version of 3 input NAND gate. Here you have got 3 inputs A, B and C and here is the footer transistor connected to ground header PMOS transistor connected to supply voltage VDD uh, and you have applied clock phi, clock phi to these inputs and here is the typical you know that load capacitance that we consider. In addition to that each, each of these junctions will have some capacitance associated with it and here also there will be some capacitance associated it with it. Let us assume this is C1, this is C2 this is uh, this is C 3. Okay. 
So, initially let us assume the input is uh, 1 1 1. What will happen whenever the inputs are 1 1 1 that means A, B and C all are 1. In that case it can be modeled as you know in, each, uh, the, uh, in this case what will happen there will be a uh, these the, uh, in, the, in the evaluation phase uh, during the precharge phase this capacitor will charge to uh, VDD. So, it will have a uh, charge to VDD level. So, it will have a charge equal to CDD into VL that is the amount of charge it will be holding. Now, uh, uh, then during the evaluation phase when 1 1 1 is applied what will happen uh, these capacitors will discharge. These times the these capacitors will discharge C L, C 1, C 2 all the capacitors will discharge because this is connected to ground, this is also sorted, this is also sorted and so on. So, as a consequence at the output you will get 0 volt after evaluation. So, the 0 volt and also this capacitor, this capacitor, this capacitor C 1, C 2, C 3 all are uh, C 1, C 2, C 3 uh, all are discharged during evaluation. Now, let us assume that we are now applying another input uh, during evaluation this input we are changing the input from 111 to 110. So, in this case during precharge uh, this capacitor will hold an amount of charge which is equal to VDD into C L. Now, uh, C 1, C 2, C 3 uh, were not C 1, C 2, C 3 were not having any charge. Now, the input is uh, applied here is 1, 1 and 0. So, what will happen these two transistors will turn on and these two transistors will turn off. So, uh, we can model this situation by this as if uh, this, this, this is now off. So, this need not be connected. We have uh, three capacitors C L. This capacitor is connected through a switch. So, there is a switch. This is C 1 and another switch another capacitor C 2. However, in this particular case this is op and also we have got uh, another 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 uh, transistor is there another capacitor is there. So, this is also connected to ground C 3. Now, what is happening now we are closing this switch closing this switch for this input, but this is op. So, the charge that was accumulated in this capacitor C L will now get redistributed in C 1 and C 2. So, uh, what we can say that uh, now C L V D D will be equal to let us assume after redistribution of the charge it attains a voltage uh, V A. This is the node let us assume. Uh, this is this is the voltage here will be V A. So, V A into uh, now the same charge is distributed. So, this will be equal to uh, C, C L plus uh, C L plus C 1 plus C 2 because these are the three capacitors same voltage now these are connected. So, this will be the total this this charge and this charge will be same because of the you know uh, the law of you know preservation we can say that the charge amount will remain same but it will get distributed instead of in one capacitor it will be distributed in three capacitors now what is the output voltage va is now equal to vdd vdd by uh, vdd by here is cl by uh, C L plus C 1 plus C 2. So, let us assume uh, that C 1 is equal to C 2 is equal to 0 0.5 uh, C L. Then if we substitute it here what will happen? Then this will become equal to with this value this will become equal to uh, V D D by 2. So, you can see that after distribution of the charge 
redistribution of the charge, the output is becoming V d d by 2. But ideally, it should have seem, remained at V d d. So, what is happening in this case? What is happening? Uh, because of the parasitic capacitances present in the internal loads, the charge that was uh, the load capacitance was holding at the time of pre-charge will get distributed in other those parasitic capacitances leading to reduction in the output voltage. And that output level can be, can be so low that uh, it will be treated, it may be treated as a low level, not high level. So, this is the problem uh, of charge sharing problem. So, we have explained it and we, and we are getting a lower voltage. How this problem can, can be overcome? This problem can be overcome by using a weak PMOS uh, transistor as I explained, as I mentioned in the last case. This is also used to uh, overcome the problem of uh, charge leakage problem. So, a weak PMOS is added as pull off transistor this transistor always remains on and behaves like a pseudo NMOS circuit during evaluation phase. So, it will be somewhat like this. So, what you are doing? You are essentially, so this is the standard uh, you know uh, uh, dynamic uh, CMOS circuit, we will be you will be adding one additional transistor here. This is a weak PMOS. What do you really mean by weak PMOS? This weak PMOS transistor is always on because it is grounded. So, it is acting uh, like a pseudo NMOS circuit during, during evaluation because during evaluation this transistor is off, but this part is on. So, it is acting as a kind of uh, pseudo NMOS circuit and uh, this by weak I mean that uh, resistance is very high. In other words, the current that it that it will supply is very small. When the resistance is high, uh, current will that will be it will supply to the load capacitance will be small, and as a consequence, it will replenish the charge that is lost either due to leakage problem or due to charge sharing problem. That means it will uh, you know replenish the charge uh, that uh, that uh, that can get lost due to charge sharing and uh, charge uh, distribution problem, charge sharing or charge leakage problem. So, this is one solution that can be used. However, you know uh, during evaluation phase as you can see uh, the output uh, will not be exactly VDD uh, because uh, there will be some drop actosite, but uh, drop actosite because uh, the, uh, the low. So, high that of course, high level voltage we are not concerned about high level voltage will be charged to VDD, low level voltage in any case will be maintained. So, it will not really affect the operation of the circuit. The reason for that is uh, the output uh, will be discharged through this path and since this is a stronger, this NMOS network is much more stronger, the output will be pulled down uh, to almost 0 level. Now, one disadvantage is, is that during uh, during the uh, time when this output is supposed to be zero this is also on this problem can be over uh, overcome by <coughs> make, making little modification what we can do we can add one inverter at the output so this is your nmos network and this is the uh, this is phi, this is phi, this is connected to VDD. Uh, now, the weak PMOS transistor is there, but weak PMOS transistor is connected and uh, not, I mean not the out the gate is not grounded, but there is an inverter and which is connected to the output. So, that means, uh, during pre-charge phase, uh, this is 1, so this will be 0, so this will be on. That means, during pre-charge phase, this will help this transistor and during evaluation phase, when the output is going down to 0, this will become 1. So, this will turn off. So, that means, during evaluation phase, this will not fight with the current uh, that will be that, that will pass through this NMOS network. So, uh, that is the, uh, the, this is the advantage of applying a uh, using a uh, inverter 
connected to the gate, but you require two additional transistors to realize the circuit. So, you can you will be having a weak PMOS as usual, but with an inverter. So, uh, we, we can see that uh, a weak PMOS with low W by L is added as full of transistor. The transistor always remains on and behaves like a pseudo NMOS circuit during evaluation phase. That is one possibility. And although there is static power dissipation due to this <coughs> during evaluation phase, there will be static power dissipation as I mentioned, uh, whenever this output is low, it helps to maintain the voltage by replenishing the charge loss due to leakage current or charge sharing, both the uh, problems are solved. However, whenever you are, you, you are adding an inverter, then this problem is overcome, you know that uh, when the output is 0, uh, then this will be 1 this transistor will turn off. So, in such a case that static power dissipation will not be there. That means, the static power dissipation is also overcome by adding that inverter. So, this is how we can really overcome the charge sharing problem uh, and also the uh, leakage current uh, uh, leakage current problem of dynamic CMOS circuits. Now, let us consider the third problem, clock skew problem. Clock skew problem arises in dynamic CMOS circuits, particularly whenever you are realizing multi level circuits. You know, normally you cannot realize a circuit by using a single stage, you have to use multi stage circuit. That means, you will be using uh, several stages. For example, uh, you will be using, let us assume this is one stage, this is one stage. this output will be applied to a next stage, only two stages are shown here. There can be multiple such stages. So, in addition to the output coming from this stage, uh, there will be some primary inputs to the next stage as well and this is connected to ground, this is connected to uh, VDD. <coughs> okay. So, in this particular case, as you can see the output of one stage is applied to the as used as input to the next stage. Now, whenever this is being done, this clock skew problem arises, clock skew. Why does it arise? Clock skew problem arises because you know you have to distribute the clock throughout the entire circuit but the uh, depending on the clock tree network, the clock signal can reach different points of the circuit at different points of the time, different points of time because of different amounts of delay uh, of the clock tree network. So, although you are assuming that clock is reaching at the same instant to different points in the circuit. So, here is you have used phi, here also you have used phi, here you have used phi, here also you have used phi. So, all of them are supposed to receive the clock at the same instant of time, but in reality that will not be so. The reason for that is you know there will be some interconnect, it will have some finite parasitic capacitances and resistances and as a consequence there will be some delay. So, it may so happen that the clock that, that, is, that will arrive to the first stage will come later than the second stage, it may so happen, happen like that. So, let us assume uh, this is the clock, this is the clock, of the stage 1, stage let us assume this is your stage i. So, this is the clock of stage i and so this is the clock of stage i plus 1. What I am telling, what can happen the clock uh, at stage i plus 1 has reached, I mean the clock has arrived earlier to stage i plus 1 than stage i. So, uh, that means, if we draw here, so it will be, it, it will come little earlier shifted in time. So, what has happened? Uh, you can see here 
this at this time t 1 it is reaching at stage i at time t 0 this is reaching uh, stage uh, next stage. What is the consequence of this? What problem can arise because of this? This is the clock skew problem. What is the outcome of this clock skew problem? You can you may note there that when this phi is 0, clock is 0, this is both are phi, but uh, at different instant of time they have reached the different points of this uh, uh, circuit. So, uh, when phi is 0 that time a particular stage in is in precharge phase, we know that at that point of time output is uh, charged to uh, high levels. That means, during precharge phase this point will be charged to VDD. But uh, when phi is equal to 1, that time it is the evaluation uh, phase of the next stage. That means, here this is the evaluation phase of the next stage. So, here, here we are doing precharge, here we are doing evaluation. Actually, ideally simultaneously precharge and evaluation should take place, but it is not happening because of the clock skew. So, let us assume that the next stage is a very simple circuit, it is an inverter. So, this is this is let us assume this is simply an inverter, this is an inverter. So, this is applied the from the previous stage it had come here and this is high because in the precharge phase it will be high or it will be VDD and uh, this is VDD and this is ground. So, because this is high, because it is be getting precharged, this, this value is coming here, it will come down to this output will this capacitor will discharge during precharge. Now, during evaluation what can happen, this, this goes down to 0. So, this becomes 0. So, it, it switches to low level. Now, when it switches to low level, you are supposed to get high here during evaluation, but unfortunately during precharge itself it was discharged, because during precharge the input was high. So, uh, it was discharged, it was discharged through this path during, because it was in the evaluation phase. So, what will happen? You will get incorrect output at this, at, at this, at this, at this point here. That means, the, uh, the, uh, the because of the overlapping of the precharge phase with the evaluation phase of the next stage, precharge phase of the first stage with the evaluation of the phase of the second stage, the you will get, you may get, I am not telling always you will get, but you may get incorrect output. So, this is arising because of the clock skew problem. The question naturally arises, this is same thing is shown here you can see uh, the evaluation is going on for the second stage and this is the precharge phase. So, clock skew problem arises because of delay due to resistance and parasitic capacitances associated with the wear that carry the clock pulse and this delay is approximately proportional to the square of the length of the wear. It has been found that the you know that uh, wear length plays a very important role in deciding the uh, delay that clock will suffer uh, to reach different points of the circuit. And uh, this clock skew problem may lead to error and this is typically known as hazard and race conditions. How can it be overcome? This problem can be overcome if the output can be set to low during precharge. So, this is the clue that can be used to uh, overcome the problem to come up with a solution. That means, what I am suggesting during evaluation we are uh, we are holding this output to low high level. Instead of that if this output is held to low level then it will not disturb the ne ne next stage. So, no, not disturb means there, there cannot be discharge you know a NMOS network input uh, I mean high level turns it on. But input is low level, it will not disturb. There is no question of the, uh, uh, I mean, getting the capacitor discharged during precharge evalu evaluation phase. So, 
uh, that has led to one solution known as domino CMOS circuit, a class of network circuit known as domino CMOS circuit. So, here as you can see each stage is provided with an inverter at the output. So, you are taking you are taking the inverted output to the next stage that means during if recharge this output is 1. So, this output will be low. So, it consists of two distinct components number 1 is the first component is a conventional dynamic pseudo NMOS network this is the is that part and second component is a static CMOS inverter buffer. So, this is the static CMOS inverter buffer. Now, what is the outcome of this? This overcomes the problem of uh, clock skew. How it is overcoming? That can be very easily explained. For example, during pre-charge you are applying a inverter here. So, when it is high then this is low. So, this cannot really discharge and then you can realize this circuit without uh, I mean uh, and you will, it will get always get correct output irrespective of this uh, delay in uh, you know clock irrespective of this clock skew problem. So, that means even if the clock arises late uh, to the first stage it will not lead to uh, premature discharge of this capacitor during uh, evaluation phase of this stage uh, and precharge phase of the previous stage. So, uh, in addition to this there are several advantages of this domino CMOS circuit. Uh, this name domino has come uh, from one uh, resemblance of a uh, you know real life situation. Actually in a domino circuit what can happen uh, if the input switches from 1 to 0 it, it may lead to a, uh, a number of stages discharging one after the other I am falling uh, 1 to 0, 1 to 0, 1 to 0 just like falling dominoes. This can happen in your bicycle stand. You push one bicycle it, uh, it leads to falling of another bicycle, it leads to falling of another bicycle that is the domino effect. That kind of thing, thing can ca happen in a multi stage uh, domino CMOS circuit. So, that means that uh, falling to high level to low level that, that can happen in, uh, in your evaluation phase. So, that may lead to a number of stages uh, output may fall from high to low one after the other uh, like uh, a num uh, like the dominoes fall in practical real life. <coughs> Second is uh, reduced chip area, reduced chip area is essentially the it has inherited uh, because of uh, because it is a dynamic CMOS circuit because it also uses only one block on n block or uh, n block. So, it will uh, it will require a smaller ch chip area compared to uh, static CMOS and higher speed of operation I have already explained uh, and only delay that occurs is rising delay. Rising delay is essentially due to uh, charging uh, during the precharge phase, but you know it is controlled by a clock. So, uh, clock is decided that way and, and there is no short circuit power dissipation as I have already explained and there is no glitching power dissipation. These two uh, it has inherited uh, uh, from the basic structure of a dynamic CMOS circuit and uh, these are the advantages of a domino CMOS circuit. Unfortunately, here also there are some limitations. What are the limitations? Each gate requires an inverting buffer as you have seen you have to provide an uh, you know a this is a static CMOS inverter. So, one PMOS and one NMOS transistors are required this is an additional requirement and all the gates are non-inverting in nature that means what is happening you know the output will become as I, as I mentioned uh, this is a N block. So, if you consider the output in terms of the input this output is a negative function, but because of the presence of this inverter this is becoming a positive function. So, this is a serious limitation. So, all the gates are non-inverting in nature in other words it is realize a positive unit function that means the domino CMOS each domino CMOS stage can realize only a positive unit function. That means uh, you know as you know you cannot really realize any uh, general boolean function either using AND gate or OR gate 
which are positive unit functions. So, you can realize any Boolean function by using NOR gate or by using NAND gate which are negative functions. So, uh, you require uh, some uh, some kind of inversion and uh, and you know uh, this is the limitation we shall see how it can be overcome. Then higher switching activity, it has got higher switching activity because uh, later on we shall see you know always during precharge phase you are charging it to high. And then it may go discharge or not discharge that means that uh, that output is always switch in each clock to high level. It may switch to low level, may not switch. So, this is a this will lead to higher switching activity, higher switching activity means the dynamic power dissipation will be larger. Later on we shall discuss about it in more detail. Uh, so, how do you really overcome this uh, pr the problems associated with Domino CMOS? Reorganize logic using bubble shifting to transform the circuit. Let me explain what is really meant by bubble shifting. Say suppose you have a you have a, a network like this. So this is let's assume this is OR, not not NOR. So A B then C D and this function you have to realize. Obviously, uh, this is not a positive unit function, but this cannot be realized by a single domino stage. What you can do? You can use the basic property, uh, basic property of this say this is equivalent to OR and with inverted inputs. That means, this is a NAND gate, NAND gate means uh, A B bar and this is equal to A bar or B bar. That means, we have applied this bubble means A bar and here bubbles mean B bar and this is an OR gate. So, this property can be used to shift the bubble from the output to the input. So, from here to here, from here to next stage. So, let us see we can how you can transform it. So, this will get transformed into uh, inverter and two bubbles at the input. This is a OR gate and you have got. So, after trans first level of trans first bubble shifting we get the equivalent circuit. Now, this bubble, this bubble cancel out. So, we get again and this bubble can be again shifted to the input of this. So, here you will have uh, OR OR and this, this is an OR gate. So, it can be considered as a AND with two bubbles at the input. So, A, B, C, D and here you get the output. That means, what has been done? This is equivalent to putting an inverter here, putting an inverter here. And this part, this part is now a positive unit function. So, this can be realized by a domino stage. And this can be done by using the uh, bubble shifting property. And you know, you can convert any network having in uh, having NAND gate, NOR gate, inverter into a positive unit function that means a network of AND and OR gates. And after that it can be realized by a single domino stage and of course, you have to apply in you have to apply the inverted input that can be done because inverters uh, in, in inputs may be available in inverted form or you will be applying uh, uh, additional static CMOS uh, static invert inverters at the primary inputs. So, this is how it can be done. Second technique that can be used is dual rail domino logic. What, what normally what we are doing? We are applying input and producing F. In addition to F, you will be also realizing F bar. That means, 
uh, you are converting a dual rail circuit that means a basic domino circuit can be modified to realize f as well as f bar simultaneously then it will be you know wherever uh, inverter is required you will be applying inverter so the uh, it is no longer realizing only positive unit function because it is realizing uh, positive unit and its complement that means if it is a and then this will be an AND output. So, uh, it is essentially a dual rail logic, dual rail implementation. Later on again I shall discuss about it in more detail, this is how the dual rail logic can be realized. Okay. Domino uh, CMOS. Now, there is another way of overcoming this problem by using NORA logic. What you do in NORA logic? we are using a NMOS block followed by a PMOS block. So, what we are doing here, uh, earlier we have seen that the, uh, the uh, you know that when during precharge, the previous stage is disturbing the next stage if, is, if, it, is, if, it, if it is in the revaluation phase. Now, if it is a PMOS transistor, then a high level output will not disturb it. So, what we are doing? Uh, we are using alternatively a uh, NMOS block followed by PMOS block followed by NMOS block and so on. That means, you are realizing multi level circuits, but we are not using only NMOS block in the realization. We have already discussed about it that we can use both PMOS and NMOS uh, block uh, in the realization. So, uh, NMOS followed by P block followed by N block this will not disturb it because whenever this is high and this is in even it is in the evaluation phase a, as you know high level input to a PMOS transistor uh, does not turn it on and as a consequence uh, the it will not affect the, uh, the next stage. So, this is known as NORA logic where from the NORA has come name NORA has come. NORA is the name is not the name of any person actually it has come from no race, no race, NORA. So, these two have been added, no race. As we know, uh, normally whenever you have multi level circuits because of clock skew problem, race condition arises leading to uh, different kinds of problems including malfunctioning, inaccurate uh, output and so on. That problem is overcome by using this logic. So, NORA stands for no race. By alternately using P blocks and N blocks, the clock skew problem is overcome in NORA logic circuits. Here, both the N and P blocks are in precharge phase when uh, one clock is 1 or clock is 0. So, you can see we are applied, you know, here you are applying clock and here we are applying clock bar. That means, uh, uh, both, both these stages are in the precharge phase simultaneously and uh, evaluation phase simultaneously and as a consequence you can realize uh, circuits in this manner. In fact, this type of uh, configuration can be used to realize pipeline circuits, pipeline implementation of different stages alternatively, alternately using NMOS block followed by PMOS block followed by NMOS block and so on. So, uh, this technique can be used to realize pipeline multi level circuits. Uh, let us not go into the details of that, but let, let me illustrate the you the it with, with the help of an example. Uh, but before we illustrate with the help of an example, here is some comparison compared to domino technique, this approach gives higher flexibility. Uh, both inverted and non inverted single ends are available from the NORA technique. Actually, what you can do, you can apply an inverter here, and if, 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 if this stage has to drive a NMOS block, you can put an inverter here. Similarly, if this stage has to drive a another uh, stage uh, which is P block, you can put an inverter here. So, in this way, it gives you more flexibility. <coughs> And particularly this decalpa processor 
The first 250 megahertz CMOS Proinco processor made extensive use of neural logic circuits. I mentioned about it earlier, you know that DEC Alpha was the fastest processor at one point of time and they implemented this with the help of extensive use of uh, neural logics in their circuits in their implementation, particularly about 30 percent of the logic circuits were realized by using dynamic neural logic remaining of course by using static CMOS. Okay, let us now come to an example. Uh, this is that full adder using static CMOS I discussed in my last lecture. Uh, as you know, uh, a single full adder cell can be realized by using static CMOS approach and uh, as you know, this requires both uh, NMOS network, PMOS network uh, for both uh, realizing the carry as well as some functions and the total number of transistors that is required in this particular case is 28 as we know. Now, let us see how we can convert it into a NORA uh, logic circuit. It can be very easily transformed into NORA logic. Only thing that you have to do, uh, you have to remove, you have to remove the PMOS, NMOS network, this NMOS, this sorry, this PMOS network is removed. So, first stage is realized by using only a NMOS network uh, and with one uh, PMOS header and NMOS footer as it is shown here, PMOS header, NMOS footer and the NMOS network. So, instead of 10 transistors, now you require uh, uh, 7 transistors, so three, 3 transistors less. Moreover, you can see your output is going to only PMOS, uh, only one input not uh, P and N and that also reduces the capacitance. Again, the next stage is realized by removing by removing the uh, NMOS network because we are realizing a NORA circuit. So, this NMOS network is removed and it is realized by using PMOS network and so this is the NORA stage and I mean NORA logic circuit where NMOS followed by PMOS network is used for realizing the next stage and here as you can see output is taken from here and of course, you will require two inverters uh, like the previous case, two inverters are there, static CMOS inverter uh, to drive the uh, next stage and uh, that is how you realize the NORA CMOS realization of full adder. So, what is the total number of transistors here? Instead of 28, here you have got uh, 7 plus 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, 9, here 9, 9 plus 7 and then of course, 16 plus 2 plus 2, 20. So, you have got 20 transistors instead of 28, but in a, not only there is reduction in the number of transistors, uh, also you know the each stage is driving one transistor instead of two, it, and there is no need to drive both PMOS and NMOS transistor. Uh, as it is necessary in case of this. Uh, as you can see, you are driving each output is driving a PMOS and an NMOS, but here you have to drive only a PMOS and if it is coming from the, the previous stage will drive only the NMOS. So, there also there is significant reduction in capacitance and as a result, uh, this is uh, pretty fast. As I mentioned, the, it will be about 4 times faster than the uh, static CMOS implementation. So, we can summarize what we have discussed so far. Uh, the advantage of low power of CMOS circuits and smaller cheap area of NMOS circuits are combined in dynamic CMOS circuits leading to smaller area and lower power dissipation. And we have also discussed single and two phase realizations of dynamic CMOS circuits and we have discussed various advantages and also the disadvantages in this lecture the charge leakage problem, charge sharing problem and clock skew problem and we have discussed how these problems can be overcome. Finally, we have uh, discussed about two popular implementations Domino CMOS and Nora CMOS which are used in realizing dynamic CMOS circuits. So, with this we have come to the end of uh, today's lecture and in the next lecture we shall discuss about how circuits can be realized by using switch logic, not gate logic. You know, so far we have discussed about gate logic, static CMOS as well as uh, dynamic CMOS where you are applying your input to the gate, taking output from source or drain. 
and uh, we have already discussed about the use of transistor as a switch and in the next class we shall discuss about how uh, that concept can be extended to realize combinational circuits by using switch logic. Essentially those are known as pass transistor logic. Okay. Thank you.